football program, <laughs> for that matter. Um, Jim here has had a long association with universities that know something about football programs, and it is no coincidence that we started winning the, t <laughs> the day he booked his fly here. <laughs> um, Professor Matthews is a very close friend of the department, and um, uh, in, in China they say that if your grandfather shared the same water buffalo, your cousins. So cousin Jim here got his PhD working on a proton decay experiment in the Park City mine, sharing the same mine with our legendary Professor Koifel. So obviously he's a cousin of this department, and you know, Jack Koifel was kind of like grandfather to us all here. And uh, after that, after graduating from the University of Wisconsin with a PhD, he spent uh, some time in Hawaii, lucky man, uh, at a gamma ray observatory on Akahaka. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> And then, um, and then spent quite a few years at University of Michigan, again, a place that knows something about football. Uh, and, and, when, and while he was at Michigan, he worked on the NIA array, not missing in action, but the Michigan array, which was located in Utah at Dugway Proving Ground, uh, at the same place where the flights are used to be. So again, we share the same water bubble. And uh, so most recently, he's uh, been working at, since about 2004, he's been a professor at Louisiana State, and working on the Auger uh, Observatory, uh, our very dear friends in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, anyway, so uh, please give him your welcome and applauding his presence. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me, for inviting me back despite all that. Um, it's a pleasure to be back here, and I've enjoyed all the conversations I've had, some with old friends, some with new friends. And I can say with confidence, I have never been, in, been introduced to give a colloquium with any reference to water buffaloes. So <laughs> it, it, it's a one-of-a-kind experience already, okay? Thank you. I am here to talk about results from the Pierre Auger Observatory. Some of you are keenly aware of these results. Others, maybe not so. We'll just go with what Charlie said and refer to ourselves and the TA people as dear friends, okay? Um, in seriousness, though, the field of ultra-high energy cosmic rays is a scientifically fascinating, I think. It's, it has a lot, of, a lot of interesting aspects to it. And the only games in town for doing that are the TA and the Pierre Auger Observatory. We are the game, okay? So, I'm pleased uh, to be a part of that, and I'm happy to be joining my friends here for a while, anyway, to talk about things. Now, <clears throat> um, those of you who may be not directly familiar with it, let me give a little bit of an introduction about what we're talking about here, why this is interesting science. The cosmic ray spectrum is a steeply falling spectrum. This is, this is observations uh, at the wood what it would look like at the top of the atmosphere of the Earth. The flux of particles varies enormously from low energies to high energies. All right. A few particles per square meter per second with energies of a TeV, 10 to the 12 eV, something like that. It's a power law, nearly featureless. That's fascinating. As any astro astronomer or astrophysicist will tell you, Seeing a power law and not a thermal energy spectrum is singing to you something, and you don't know what, but it's interesting, all right? Um, there's one interesting feature. The first feature you run into at about 10 to the 15 eV, a little above that, is something called the knee, where the steeply falling spectrum becomes steeper. Something's happening there. We don't know what that is happening there. So that's an interesting question with a lot of experimental activity. We have some ideas, but, but it goes on and on, all the way out to the end, okay? It's called the end, and I'll, I'll tell you why we call it the end of the spectrum, out here at near 10 to the 20th EV, all right? Um, that is extraordinarily high energies. The flux is extremely low, one per square kilometer per century, all right, of cosmic rays. So you can't build a tabletop experiment to do this. Um, you have to build something huge. 
And that's what we have done with the OJ Observatory. TA doing the same thing. These are large spread out targets to measure cosmic rays. All right. Um, let me give you a, a, some notation here, the units of energy. We're, we're looking at cosmic rays with energies above 10 to the 18 electron volts up to and beyond 10 to the 20th. All right. Technically, 10 to the 18 EV is an EEV, exa EV. And there is a name for 10 to the 21, a ZEV. Okay. Um, that's 160 joules of energy up at 10 to the 21. That's a lot of energy to put into a particle, like a proton. Right. Other units are possible. Um, that's about the same amount of energy a violent act from a boxer would inflict upon you. Uh, a hard-thrown baseball. Uh, again, we're talking this kind of energy, except instead of in a baseball or in Mike Tyson, it's in a proton. Uh, a bullet from a gun. Any physical violence between people you could think of is sort of in this regime, all right? Um, to put it in more practical terms, perhaps, is to look at the CERN accelerator, right, which is accelerating protons onto protons. Uh, the energy of the collisions, the proton beams are, are in the vicinity of 10 TeV. That's a lot of energy. You have to build an accelerator that's big to do that, really big. Okay? Uh, the collision energy is equivalent to a cosmic ray proton of 5 times 10 to the 16 EV colliding with an atmospheric uh, nucleus at rest. Okay? In other words, to look at the kind of particle physics that we're seeing in cosmic rays, CERN, CERN is sort of the equivalent of looking at 10 to the 16 EV cosmic rays. Auger and TA, we're, at, we're four orders of magnitude higher than that. We're exploring particle physics that is inaccessible on Earth. Okay? Um, and it probably always will be. Because to get up to even these kind of energies, you look at how big an accelerator you have to build to contain the particles in the, in the beam. So this is remarkable stuff, these cosmic rays at these energies. There's a lot of physics to be had. Um, I'm going to focus on the project that I've been working on since the beginning of IT, the Auger Observatory. Uh, it's been around since uh, first conceived in the mid-90s. At the present time, I'm not sure, I, I didn't update this number, uh, but there's approximately 500 scientists from 18 countries involved all over the globe. Um, the aim of the experiment is a relatively straightforward thing to state. We observe cosmic rays at extraordinarily high energies. We do not know where they come from. We do not understand how they can get to such a high energy. We're trying to visualize a mechanism to get them up to 10 to the 20 EV. That's hard to do. Okay. Um, we don't know what they are. All right. We have seen protons, probably. We have seen heavier nuclei, probably. Are there gamma rays? Are there neutrinos? Not clear. Okay. That's the kind of thing we're aiming to study. And finally, looking at their interactions, the cosmic rays interact in the atmosphere. We're doing particle physics at energies well beyond what is available or ever will be at earthly accelerators. Um, how do you do this? Well, one of the problems that you have with cosmic rays at most of them, maybe all of them, are charged particles, protons or nuclei. And that means that as they travel, they, their trajectories are not straight, but curved in the magnetic fields that are out there. There's magnetic fields in the galaxy of a few micro gauss, and there's magnetic fields between galaxies, which can vary. It's all pretty uncertain, but probably less. Nanogauss, I don't know. Um, at 10 to the 18, electron volts. All right. This is just kind of a cartoon of what uh, a proton at 10 to the 18 EV, the kind of trajectories it would have within our galaxy. It would be trapped in our galaxy, M mostly trapped. But the point is, is that when it arrives and you measure it, it's not pointing anywhere near back from where it came. Okay? So you can't 
just look at it and say it came from there. It, you have no idea. The direction is completely scrambled. Um, you get up to 10 to the 19 EV, things kind of straighten out a bit. Okay? You're doing a little better, a little better. Now this is cheating you because I've started this, this cosmic ray in our galaxy, not that far away from us. Okay? But I'm just trying to make the point. In real life, if this was coming from outside of our galaxy, its direction would also be rather deflected. Okay? Not until you get up to 10 to the 20th EV do you really start to have a chance of observing a cosmic ray and just looking to see what direction it came from. This is the idea is, I'd like to know the source. Is this thing pointing back to anything interesting out there? All right. um, so that's a basic thought about how to do this, this kind of physics. Now, as I said, it's hard to visualize how to get a cosmic ray up to 10 to the 20th EV. There were two main ways of thinking about that okay, back in the day, and to this day, too. Uh, one is called bottom-up, which means you take a proton, say, or anything, and you accelerate it from low energies up to 10 to the 20th EV. You accelerate it, take a low energy thing and somehow boost it up. Okay? The other possibility is called the top-down mechanism, where you invent some fabulous new particle that no one's ever seen before that's really, really massive, and it decays and gives you 10 to the 20th EV decay products. All right? um, this had a lot of theoretical interest in it, and I'll, I'll I'll, uh, I'll spit in your milk right now and tell you that we've pretty much shown that that is not possible. That is not what's happening here, but we'll get to that later. Um, the Fermi acceleration process is a very attractive thing, theoretically. It's repeated interactions with plasma shock waves. Okay? A plasma, a plasma shock wave moving out. I'll show you a picture of where you find those. Every time this thing bounces off and comes, it does a cycle, comes in and comes out again, it gains a little bit of energy. On average, it gains a little bit of energy. So the more cycles you go through, the more collisions you have, the higher your energy will be. Right? So if you want to get up to 10 to the 20th EV, you just need to have a lot of collisions. Now, one of the lovely features of this mechanism, which was proposed by Fermi himself, um, is that I think you can see that it's possible for these particles at some point maybe to just get lost and escape and get out of there, in which case they won't get accelerated anymore. The highest energy particles are more likely to do that. They have nice straight paths and they can get away from you. What's the bottom line? Is you end up with a power law spectrum just like what was observed. And the index of the power law is fairly reasonable to calculate. It doesn't depend strongly on a lot of fine details here. It gives you a power law about e to the minus 2, which is what has been observed. So this is a lovely thought to have. We don't know if it's true, okay? but it's a nice thing to hang your hat on when you're trying to figure out what's going on. Um, at lower energies, we see some evidence. This is TeV stuff. People in the last decade or so have started to see gamma rays, high energy gamma rays appearing at the edge of supernova remnants, expanding out shock wave remnants like that. That could be indicative of particles being accelerated and then colliding with stuff and giving you gamma rays. In other words, there's some evidence here uh, at, at lower energies. TeV is 10 to the 12. Um, bigger is better. The bigger the shock wave, the higher energy you can get to. The longer it lasts, the higher energy you can get to. So you start to look at things like AGNs and the really big, the really nasty objects out there. We think there's a fair chance that that could be the kind of thing that's getting the job done. Um, the violence could be occurring, the acceleration could be occurring at the core or out on the jets. The jets are a nice, nice thing to think about that way. Because you've got the shock wave is traveling out enormous distances. It lasts a long time. If you can get surfing on that all the way, you could get up to pretty high energies, we think. All right. 
So these are the kind of things you go looking at. This is what you try to do. You take your highest energy particles that you can measure and just see, are they pointing back to things like this that we know of? I don't know. We'll see. Um, this is a relatively famous and, and kind of simple plot made by Michael Hillis a long time ago, showing you what's possible in the way of an accelerator. This tells you that if you have a region of size L with a magnetic field B, like that, and a shock wave moving at beta, like that, this is the highest possible energy you can get. All right? Order of magnitude. This is exactly the same form you get in freshman physics if you pull a loop through a magnetic field. You get exactly that is the energy of the electrons that get accelerated by Faraday's law. Exactly the same. Exactly the same. Same kind of thinking. Um, so anyway, things that are big, even if they have a small magnetic field, in principle could conspire to give you on this green line, or excuse me, on this red line, this would be a uh, 10 to the 18 EV proton, like that. The dashed line would be a 10 to the 20th EV proton. So you start to look at objects in the universe, big things, even with relatively modest fields, things like galaxy clusters, the halo. These are kiloparsec, megaparsec sized things. The fields aren't terribly strong, milligauss, microgauss, something like that. You could, in principle, also look at neutron stars, which are small objects but spinning with high magnetic fields. In principle, that, that could work, maybe. I don't know. But as I've mentioned to others, the, the neutron star, that's a nice idea. But that's a real tough neighborhood. That's a hard neighborhood. There's a lot of radiation there. Even if you're trying to accelerate a proton, the chances are he's going to get badly roughed up by things. So this is not the most attractive option. Mostly we're looking at big things out there. It's interesting to me, too, when I first saw this plot, how if you plot all the things that are out there in the universe, plot their size versus their field, they all kind of cozy up to these lines that take you up to about 10 to the 20th EV of a cosmic ray. Why is that? I don't know. That's bizarre, I think. That's a coincidence to me. All right. Now here's another feature that's important when we talk about trying to do these measurements. Something called the GZK cutoff. Um, this was pointed out in the middle 60s it, by, by two groups. One was, well, well, two people, three people. Kenneth Grison did one. Zatsepin and Kuzmin did another. They published their papers almost at the same time, um, where they noted that a high energy proton, a really high energy proton, 10 to the 19 EV, is crossing the threshold for having particle interactions with cosmic background photons. Cosmic background photons were first discovered in 1963, so these guys were on the job. Okay. Um, a cosmic background photon has an energy of 10 to the minus 4 electron volts. It's very tiny energy. So you have to get to be a very, very energetic proton above 10 to the 19 EV before you get over the threshold for your very first hadronic inelastic interaction. This is the first thing you can do. Make a pion, okay? Now, once you do that, once you're able to do that, once your energy is big enough that you can do that, the universe becomes quite opaque because there are 400 cosmic background photons per cubic centimeter, okay? So suddenly, it becomes very hard for you to travel long distances if you're a proton. You're going to run into something, okay? And it's going to end badly for you. So, Protons above about 10 to the 19 EV-ish, okay? They're, you're not going to see them very easily. Above 10 to the 20th EV, they're just not going to get to Earth. They're going to interact before they do that. Now, this is a plot to suggest that. It says a distance, if you propagate, when you're born, let's say you're, at, you're born at one megaparsec here, that's, we'll call that zero, right? And if you're, suppose you're a proton and you have one of these energies, how far can you travel? Okay. 
Notice that this interaction makes a pion, but a proton also comes out, or a neutron. So you come in, you go out, you have less energy when you come out. What does that look like if you're a beam? Well, it means if you travel a distance, your proton beam will show progressively lower and lower energies like that. If you're more than about 100 megaparsecs away, you will never see a cosmic ray proton above uh, a few hundred EEV. So this limits the universe that we can see. That's a good thing, though. The universe is a big place. All right? If we see cosmic rays at 10 to the 20th EV, they must be coming from relatively nearby. Relatively means within 100 megaparsecs. Okay, so that's big, but not on the scale of the universe. All right, so that's, that's the rules of the game. Um, what would that look like? Suppose you have a power law spectrum of cosmic rays. The GZK cutoff, nice power law like that. The GZK cutoff would just cut it off. Starting at a few times 10 to the 19, your spectrum would just die. You wouldn't see things up there. There's one feature of this, though, that you might see a little bit of a pile up there. It's these, these, these higher energy ones get reduced in energy. So, you know, this, this would have kind of a shape. If you had enough statistics, you would you'd kind of want to look for that. That would tell you about GZK and where the sources are. Okay, where are they? Um, I won't get into this except to say, you know, there's, there's a good chance that a lot of cosmic rays are not just protons, but heavier nuclei. And it turns out that if you're like an iron nucleus, you're also going to get harmed by running into cosmic background photons. At these energies, if you're at 10 to the 20th EV, you're going to excite the giant dipole resonance. You're going to break up the iron nucleus. You're going to kill it. Okay? The cross-section for that is <laughs> remarkably similar as the cross-section was for protons interacting. So the point is simple. Uh, iron nuclei are harder to break up than lighter nuclei. And they're going to start breaking up at about the same energies that protons are going to start to be lost, seriously. So if I start off with a cosmic ray beam um, that has all elements in it, after 100 megaparsecs or so, there's a fairly good chance that I won't see anything except iron and protons. The lighter elements will have been destroyed very early on because they're so easy to break up. All right. Anyway. How do we do it? Here's the OJ idea. Um, it's not dissimilar to what TA is doing, a little different, but not really. The flux is low, so what we look at are the interactions of the cosmic rays in the atmosphere of the Earth. Cosmic ray proton comes in, collides with a, an atmospheric nucleus like nitrogen, oxygen, makes an enormous spray of secondary particles. There's a lot of electrons and positrons showering down, a lot of them. There's a lot of muons okay, that come out. Muons are features of hadronic interactions. Okay. So a proton crashing into a nucleus, you're going to make muons. Muons tend to come out with a little bit more perpendicular momentum just because of the way hadronic interactions are. You've got some more p-perp available to you there. So you've got more electrons than muons. But the muons are spreading out more, so unless you're right near the core, you're going to see a lot of muons at the ground. Another feature that matters here is the energies. Electrons are puny little things, so as they come skating through the atmosphere, they're losing energy. By the time they get to the ground, they're a few MeV. Muons are made of sterner stuff than that. By the time they get to the ground, they're still 5 GeV, so they're more energetic when they hit the ground. That, that, that'll matter in a minute for detection. Uh, oh, a shower develops. There's a 10 to the 19th EV shower. It grows, gets bigger and bigger, lots of particles. Maxes out, all right, at uh, 10 to the 10 particles. These are big showers. The penetration into the atmosphere, 750 grams to maximum. The entire vertical atmosphere is 1,000 grams. So these things are really big showers penetrating deeply in the atmosphere. 
Uh, grams per square centimeter is the preferred unit here. All right, so here's two, the two techniques that have been used historically, and we're using both of them. One is to look at the air shower when it hits the ground, to actually collect the particles with detectors on the ground. The air shower, as it's coming down, will actually be kind of like a pancake, okay, hitting like that. Another way is to look optically at the shower as it passes. This is the fly's eye technique. Okay? The air shower has so many particles in it that it's going to excite atmospheric nitrogen. And there'll be fluorescence from that. It's actually the same process that makes the northern lights. Okay? It's brief and it's weak, but with good optics, you can take a lovely snapshot of showers as they develop. Um, the advantages, the fluorescence technique, the optical technique, you're doing calorimetry. You're watching the whole shower develop. Very good at energy uh, resolution, determining the energy. The surface arrays, on the other hand, they have an advantage that they can run 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The optical devices can't. The light is so feeble that they can only run on dark, moonless nights. Okay. So the two techniques together are where you can really win. Now, the fluorescence technique was invented in Utah. Um, there was a lot of people involved in this. George Cassidy's name comes to my mind right away. Um, about 1980, okay, these are the guys that invented the technique and made it work. Okay, this was a great advance. This was originally suggested by Kenneth Grison in the early to mid-60s, but it was here that it was made to work. Um, you may, this is out at Dugway, all right, and you're up on a hill, and this is where we discovered Bob Cady. Okay, he was he was found here, and <laughs> so he's he's been part of it ever since the beginning. <laughs> um, there's a picture of the hill where Fly's Eye was originally built, Five Mile Hill. It's called. It's up there. There it is, up there. It's not a tall mountain. It's out in the Dugway wastelands. But down here in the foreground, you can see there's some other stuff. This is a surface array that Chicago and Michigan put together, the Casa Mia array, in the, in the shadow of the fly's eye, about 1990. This is a surface array, okay, where we, we did that, and we tried to work in coincidence when we could with the fly's eye. This was the original way of trying to do air shower physics, to do both surface array for the particles, an optical device to watch the shower develop. Now here's a cartoon of an air shower hitting a surface array. You can see how it's a pancake, curved, but how it hits detectors one after another. If you do the relative timing of the detectors as they're being hit, you can reconstruct that direction that it came from. You can do a pretty good job, maybe a degree or so resolution. Now astronomers are cringing, crying, saying, a degree? What good is that? But everyone else goes, wow, a degree, that's great. Okay. In, in our business, that is great. Uh, it's not like the sky is so full of sources that we're going to get confused. All right? If I could get to within a degree, I'm a very happy guy. Okay. Um, Oje is located in southern, the South America, in western Argentina, just over the Andes Mountains from Santiago de Chile. Um, it's a large project that's expensive, it requires international participation, so we looked at the world, all right? And Argentina had a lovely location, they had a great willingness to participate and help us locally, so that's where we first picked the spot. Our intention all along was to build an identical facility in the northern hemisphere so we could cover the entire sky. Unfortunately, the United States Department of Energy and the NSF thought one was enough, so we never got to build up north. Okay. Um, that's fine. TA is up there now, so we've got the sky covered. Here's a layout, a picture of the layout of the Auger surface detectors. All right. Every dot is a surface detector. There's 1,600 surface detectors. They're spaced a mile apart on a nice regular grid covering 3,000 square kilometers, the way we've got it. Over here on the sides, we have fluorescence detectors. Okay. They're looking out 
over the surface array. Our intention, our goal is to have, is to look at events that are seen by both the surface array and the fluorescence detector. The original fly's eye had a nice capability that for larger air showers it could see further and further away. So its acceptance got even bigger, which was nice. That's a nice thing. Uh, we decided to do it not that way to save some money. All right? We're only needing to look out over where we've got surface detectors. We are not looking at showers that end up further away than that. Okay? If we had an infinite amount of money, we could have put more fluorescence detectors looking all over the whole sky, and, but we didn't. Now, how big is this? Okay? The usual thing we say is it's about as big as Delaware or Rhode Island. Um, here's the layout again. Here's Salt Lake. That's how big it would be. Okay. So it covers a lot of ground, about 40 miles or something on a side. Um, here's one of our fluorescence detectors, again up on a smaller hill. We are out in the middle of nowhere where the skies are dark all right, at night. And I should make sure I say that. Um, and it's remote, but there's a nice town there nearby that is welcoming to us and uh, provides us infrastructure, so it's a good place to work. Our fluorescence detectors have taken a lot of uh, design thought straight out of the fly's eye. I won't get into this here, with I don't have time, but uh, it works the same way. There is a big mirror which looks out sort of sideways up to about 30 degrees, uh, spherical mirror surface, and the focal plane of the mirror has 440 phototubes. Each phototube is about a degree and a half. In other words, you see the whole sky like a fly's eye would. All right? This is what an event would look like as it crosses our field of view. The colors are giving you the timing on it. It's, uh, it's a nice technique. Um, there's another picture. You can see, if you look at the intensity of light, you can see the shower developing and growing and falling down. It's a beautiful snapshot, calorimetry. Um, and on and on. There's variations among showers, but still, th these, are, these are good measurements to make. Everything I'm saying here is pretty much the same story for the telescope array, or the fly's eye, too. It's pretty much the same. Uh, here's one of our surface detectors. It's a big tank of water. That's a, a, that's a, a solar panel on it, because all the, there's a lot of electronics on board, but it only operates at about 10 watts. And you don't want to be stretching cables out over areas as big as this. So it's self-powered. And it radios its information. It records. It triggers. It records. And it radios communication up here back to a central station where events are put together. All right? It's a big bag of water. There are three photomultiplier tubes in it looking into the water. The idea is to look at the particles in an air shower. They come through, they make Cherenkov light, and they light up your phototubes. Five GeV muons will travel all the way through. Five MeV electrons won't get very far, but there's a lot of them. Okay? So we can sort of tell the difference between muons and electrons this way. Um, I won't dwell on this. This is a picture. This is a, uh, a signal from a tank rather close to the core of the shower. And you can see it's sort of a smooth thing. There's a lot of electrons there. If you get kilometers away, all right, a couple of kilometers away, now it's very spiky. The spikes are muons, individual muons that you can pick out. There's a lot of muons out there compared to electrons. So this is the way this game gets played. Uh, here's one of the neighbors. If you look carefully, he's got a cell phone, but um, he does. And there's one of our tanks. Uh, here's some more of our neighbors. Um, these are the physicists there and there. Okay. <laughs> now, I used to have a joke that isn't, doesn't work anymore. I used to say that these were NSF cows <laughs> because the DOE cows would leave you alone. All right? And unfortunately, it <laughs> well, never mind. Okay. Uh, <laughs> And there's another, this is a fascinating place to work. Let me just put it that way. Um, here I am with one of my postdocs long ago. I, I only show this picture just to prove I've been there. Uh, and back there, there's the Andes. Okay, the Andes. We're, we're pretty close. These pictures don't quite give you the perspective. Did anyone ever read the book or see the movie called Alive? 
where this happened about 1970 where there was a plane load of rugby players who crashed into the Andes and were stuck there for three months and they had to resort to cannibalism. It was a terrible story. And, but most of them survived. And um, the reason I bring that up <laughs> is it was right there. It was right there. Okay, so uh, whenever you fly over the Andes, I always tell people, bring, I always bring a little bottle of Tabasco with me, just in case. You know. <laughs> well, <laughs> sorry. Uh, here was a picture. I went to the Arache meeting in 2010, and I looked out my window, and I was kind of startled to see that, but I don't know what that was for. I don't think they were doing air shower work. Um, <laughs> anyway, let me just show you some results. Uh, the energy spectrum, measuring the energy spectrum. It's important. It's a fundamental measurement to make. We're looking to find the GZK cutoff. Okay? If we see that, then we have an idea. The shape will be telling us about the sources. But we know that at least some of them are far enough away that they're, they're getting killed on the way here. All right? The detailed shape of this matters. And here, here we are. This was actually from 2015. Uh, I'll show you a slightly newer version of this, but it's, it's not really very different. I'm plotting E cubed <laughs> times the flux. So if I had an E to the minus 3 power law, it would be a straight line. So this is a little steeper than e to the minus 3. Somewhere in the mid 10 to the 18.5s, something changes. A little break there. It's called the ankle. And then we see this cutoff. Okay? That, looks, that looks just like what it's supposed to look like. All right? um, this is different ways of collecting our data. Um, we can look at all the surface detectors or ones. We have some that are a little closer spaced to do some systematic work. There's a variety of things we can do. And separately, everything kind of hangs together, looks good. If you combine everything to maximize your statistics, this is what you see. So that, that really does look like, like the GZK. This is a very sharp dip, though, and a sharp change. Something's happening here. We're not sure what. Uh, but there's information there. All right? So the energy spectrum is showing us something that we think we'd like to understand. Now here is a comparison. Uh, again, this is a little bit old of the telescope array also measured the spectrum, and OJ did. And you can see what I swear, I, I do believe I understand this, is that there is a slight systematic shift in energy scales between the two experiments. OJ is claiming these days a 14% systematic uncertainty. And at this time, anyway, TA was claiming about a 20%. That's the same thing. But let's not quibble about that. That's a systematic scale uncertainty. That would cover this problem. Right? In other words, I'm morally convinced that we're not really disagreeing all that much in what this spectrum looks like. Both of us see a cutoff, okay? and both of us see this shift at the ankle, rather sharp shift like that. Um, when was this? Again, this was a couple of years back. There's been some new things on there uh, since then, but not enough for me to worry about. All right, so this is what I showed you before of what the GZK cutoff ought to look like. And you saw our data. It kind of looks like that. I'm, you know, we're feeling pretty good. Um, what? Okay, there's that little bump, which you might like to look for. If, boy, you'd sure like to have enough statistics to see if you could resolve that, because that ought to be there, okay? But you need good statistics to try and sort that out. Is that the only possibility for what we're observing? Is, or could it be something else? What if I told you, forget about the GZK. So let, let's suppose these things are, are close enough to us that, they're, that the GZK is not relevant here. What if I just simply said to you, well, what about the source? What if the source is running out of power? Right? What would I expect to see? Well, I'd expect to see the spectrum cut off. OK, the source, whatever it is, is just running out of gas. Uh, this is what it ought to look like, maybe. Well, how do I tell the difference between that and GZK? Well, here's one way, maybe. This is a proton. If I had an iron nucleus, and assuming that all these acceleration mechanisms are electromagnetic in nature, and they are, okay, that means iron ought to get up to 26 times the energy, the maximum energy. You know, if there's only so many volts available, well, you're going to get more energy if you apply it to iron nuclei. So this tells me that I would like to know the composition of the cosmic rays and try to look at it that way. 
Um, so inferring the primary mass, I won't dwell on this except to say what you do is you look at the depth at which the air, show the air showers reach maximum size. That's a proxy for when did the particle first interact. Iron nuclei are a lot bigger than protons. They're going to interact a lot sooner. They have a bigger cross-section. It's as simple as that. Iron showers at the same energy develop higher in the atmosphere. So you look and you say, what is the height in the atmosphere of the maximum of the shower? If the height is not large, the shower was high, that's what iron ought to look like. Protons ought to be higher. If you see something like this in your data, it's telling you that the composition is changing, maybe starting at protons and getting heavier. Um, there, this is what I was saying. Let me cut to the chase. Here is what OJ was showing a few years ago. Um, and we do see that. We're plotting the depth of maximum shower development. We see a change, okay? Iron and protons ought to have about the same slope. They ought to have about the same slope versus energy. And we're seeing something is changing. Our data looks like it's, it's really very proton-like in here and getting heavier, okay? Now this is where we have perhaps some disagreement with the TA, perhaps not. This is a real active area uh, of, of collaborative research. What that means is, is we scream at each other a lot about this topic, okay? Just so you, know, you understand. Uh, we also plotted here, by the way, the, the fluctuations at a, at a fixed energy. What's the fluctuation in depth of maximum? That's kind of an independent way of looking at it. It's showing us the same thing, anyway. Um, here's our most recent picture of that. It's showing exactly the same idea. This one is actually combining some measurements of the maximum that we made with the surface detectors, which is interesting. Uh, and I can talk about that if anyone's interested later. All right, so that's what OJ sees. Here's a, a recent picture from TA, um, which is a little busier than I would like, but I just wanted to show it. Uh, each line is a different primary particle. Look at that. Okay. Iron, nitrogen, helium, proton. Um, the black points here are the data. And honestly, when you look at these points, you glance at it, you see it, it really is not screaming at you that it's like OJ. It's, it looks fairly constant when you look at it. But within the statistics, okay, and within the fitting, how much can I rule out what OJ saw? Is this a little bump here? Is this a little bit of a change? Gosh, I don't know. Is it ruled out? Not really. What we need is more statistics. We all need more statistics. We need to nail this down. It is possible that OJ and TA are seeing the very same thing. It is possible they are not. Okay. The jury is out on that. Uh, let me cut to the chase here a little bit. Let me show you a few things quickly. Um, Let's just look on the sky at OJ data. Where is it coming from? We see that we, we're seeing the southern skies, okay? Um, so here's a map of where our arrival directions are. Um, I'm not sure, oh, here we are. This is above 8 times 10 to the 18, almost 10 to the 19 EV. So these are pretty energetic events, but not really. You can see that we're getting a bit of an excess of events over in this region. Now that's not necessarily just overhead. Let me show you. The dashed line there is um, the galactic plane, okay? And the galactic center, we get a good view of that. Uh, that's over here, right? So we're seeing an excess that's not associated with the galaxy. That's interesting. I think that's interesting. The flux, all right? Um, galactic center. There I'm pointing at the sort of the maximum of our arrival directions. What's that? What is that? Where is that? All right. So what we did was we did something called the Rayleigh test. Okay? The Rayleigh test is just telling you something about isotropy. You draw a unit vector in the direction of everything you've got, and if, they are, if it's isotropic, add those unit vectors, you get zero. Just as many that way as that way. If it's not isotropic, it's not zero. Okay? Rayleigh test is a simple, well-understood way of assessing certain kinds of anisotropy. Um, so we did that, and what we're finding is a bit of a dipole when we do that. Um, we have 32,000 events above these energies. Uh, fitting to a dipole, sort of an overall dipole, was a good fit. Okay? 
as you saw, it was the red and the blue on that, on that plot. Um, amplitude is mild. The chance probability of random event directions doing this, this is about a five sigma result, okay? Taking into account the, uh, the trials factor as best we can, right? So this is fairly significant. If we did a, I won't get into the details of, but a full 3D analysis, um, it makes this uh, a little bit less uh, significant maybe, but, but not much. This is an interesting, interesting thing. Um, five sigma, okay. I won't go through that. Well, here's a map of the sky that we would see. This is, the, this is a, 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 a sky map of uh, a redshift survey of galaxies, of active galaxies and galaxies out there. How do our arrival directions compare to the locations of things we know that are out there? All right. Well, there it is. You can, can kind of ask the same question if you look at the galaxy map. That would kind of, uh, these are nearby, relatively nearby things. Okay. There's the center of that distribution, okay, the uh, MRS survey. And here was our peak. So they're, they're not exactly lined up. They're shifted a little bit. Um, but wait, that's not bad. That's good. I'll show you why. This is a map in um, galactic uh, latitude and longitude, by the way. But it's the same data that I was showing you. Um, The galactic magnetic field okay, is going to take events of these energies and it's going to, as I said, it's going to twist their trajectories. They're not going to be pointing right back to where they came from. Now, this is a function of energy. Higher energies will do better at that. Our galaxy is not known, the field, not known all that well. We have some idea of what's going on. It's sort of rolling along the spiral arms. Um, there's another picture showing the complexity of it. It's, it's not a simple thing. It's not, and and it's, it's not all that well known. But you can take a stab at it, at trying to uh, estimate that. Now here's a plot a, one of my students did. Um, just an example where we started events from Sen A, from the direction of Centaurus A, just an, an AGN that's close by. And at various energies, say, how much do they get deflected? So you can do this, all right? But you're a prisoner of the model that you're using. Uh, and you can get rather large deflections, okay, with this. So caveat emptor. Nevertheless, taking a model that we deem is, is not crazy, um, what do you get? Well, what you get is interesting to me. What you get are these arrows. If I started events from the center of this distribution, of this galaxy distribution, two EEV events would shift about that much. Five EEV events would shift a little bit less, but like that. What I've tried to suggest to you is that what we observe looks to be qualitatively consistent with these events lining up nicely with this galaxy distribution, accounting for the magnetic deflection on their way here. Nothing is proven here, but it's, it's suggestive. It's doing what you kind of want it to do. All right. Um, oh, for those of you in the know, the Compton getting effect is the fact that the Earth is moving through the cosmos. And so maybe you'd say, ah, is that what you're seeing? Are you seeing more stuff coming head on at you because you're traveling that way? No, that's too far away. This, the uh, magnitude of the effect is, is not anywhere near the same as what we expect. So that's not it. We know that. All right, so here's the direct measurement of what I just said. The, the, the conclusion here, though, is that this is strong evidence that, the, that c these cosmic rays are not coming from our own galaxy. They seem to have nothing to do with our own galaxy. They're coming from other galaxies. All right. The dipole we see is not pointing toward the galactic center. It's not the Compton getting effect. It's correlating with nearby galaxies from a certain catalog. The magnetic deflections seem to be in the right ballpark. Um, I didn't show you this, but if you look at different energies, look at higher energies, you see a little strengthening of the effect. Lower energies, less so. That's what you expect, scrambling. Uh, this got to be in Physics World magazine, 2017. All right, um, we've looked elsewhere. I won't go through this. I don't have time. We've seen some correlations. Sen A, uh, Swift Bat Catalog, Starburst Galaxies is kind of interesting. A lot of, lot of uh, supernovas going on in Starburst Galaxies. So you might be able to enhance the acceleration by bouncing off different supernova shells. 
various things. Three Sigma stuff? Eh, help me. I need statistics, all right? Um, we have not seen photons in neutrinos. We just don't see them. And that rules out these, uh, these fancy models, these top-down decay models. You'd just be getting a lot of gamma rays and neutrinos from them. We don't see any, all right? We might start to see some, though, as remnants of the GZK effect. I won't get into this, but we're very close to being sensitive to that now. We ought to start seeing some gamma rays and neutrinos as byproducts of the GZK interactions. That would be nice, because it would demonstrate we can see gamma rays and neutrinos. All right. Uh, what we're doing now is we're upgrading OJ, about a $10 million upgrade job. The idea is to do a better job at identifying the composition of the cosmic rays. We're going to do that by instrumenting detectors with stuff that we can see muons directly, more directly. So we can try to tell the difference between protons and iron and separate those and now start to look at spectra and things and see how they're different. Um, for lack of, there, this was nicely described in uh, a couple of years back in the CERN Courier. This is underway, well, well on its way. Um, we're taking the surface detector and putting stuff on top. I won't go through this, except I wanted to show you one thing, is that we've built some prototypes. Oh, we have some underground detectors, too, that are working. Uh, our first prototypes we built were out here at Dugway, or not at Dugway, at the TA site, at Delta. Um, so we can cooperate with each other all right, and try to work in coincidence with them. Um, but we've been doing it down in Argentina since then, too. Okay, let me summarize. If you look back to what I was hoping I could do in the first place, we've got a lot of it done. We're observing the GZK cutoff. We're observing a bump, an ankle in the spectrum, too, that we don't completely understand, but it looks like it's been well measured. I think we've demonstrated, at least pretty convincingly, that the sources are not from our own galaxy. They're coming from other galaxies. Um, Auger especially sees the composition appearing to become heavier, okay, heavier elements. That's interesting. There's another thing which I didn't get into here, is that maybe we just don't understand the particle physics very well here, okay? That's when our new muon detection systems might help us. Maybe the particle physics is really changing. There's some evidence of that, actually, in, in what we've done. The muon content of showers that we're measuring now doesn't look like the, what the models are, are wanting to tell us, the models that are used at CERN for the current LHC uh, and stuff. Um, We've done some particle physics. We're looking at stuff beyond the LHC energies. And we hope maybe we'll start to see photons and neutrinos pretty soon. And that is where I'll leave it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I have to apologize that I forgot to mention that uh, Jim was not just a member of uh, OJ. He was uh, of OJ in, 2000, in 2013. That's like being a Roman consul for those of you who <laughs> know what that means. Um, well, I'll answer that. Big things. <laughs> anyway, questions? So do the simulators and other new upgrades that you're installing, does that allow you to do calorimetry during the day? Um, what it does is it gives us better particle content in the shower. Essentially what that means is we're trying to measure the muon content. So it's not really that we're going to do better calorimetry. The surface detector does a pretty good job already of calorimetry, of measuring the energy. It's not terribly sensitive to the composition. There's reasons for that. So this is not particularly aimed at that, but rather it's to try to divide the data a little better into uh, lighter versus heavier volume. Um, can you go to the slide where you're comparing the cosmic ray spectrum from DA and Sure. Probably a few hours from now. Yeah. So you write off the differences between DA and OJ and this systematic uncertainty, and surely her end of the 19.5 below, that seems to make sense, but from 19.5 to 20, it seems like maybe a little more different than that. 
<laughs> I won't disagree with that. No, there, I'll tell you one thing though that, and you can ask Gordon for his opinion. All, all of our opinions are worth about the same, and I won't tell you what that is. <laughs> um, to me, I think it's very interesting that OJ and TA are seeing these differences at the highest energy, and we are looking at different parts of the sky. TA is looking at the northern sky, OJ is looking at the southern sky. Uh, I have no reason to believe those spectra ought to be identical. Okay, especially at the highest energies, where now what you're seeing is more or less pointing where it came from, more or less. Okay, at lower energies, things are so scrambled that if you have a collection of sources, TA and OJ are all going to be looking, sampling the same sources. Not at the highest energies necessarily. You might be seeing different sources. That could be real physics there. That could be real physics. What's the solution? I have an idea. Let's make TA bigger. Oh, okay. Let's do that. All right. That's the right thing to do here. That's the right thing to do. When you're matching the, the sources where they're coming from, from the like catalogs of aging, catalogs and with the galactic center, any ideas why they will come from these AGNs instead of the, the galactic center is basically all another AGN, right? Um, our, the, our galactic center apparently doesn't have enough power to get cosmic rays accelerated up to 10 to the 19.5. It just doesn't. Other AGNs might, especially AGNs with big old jets coming out. Those, those seem to be a different class. Uh, that's the kind of thing we're trying to distinguish here. The fact that we don't see things coming from our own galactic center uh, is interesting. All right? If they were, they ought to be really loud to us. Okay? So they're, they're, AGNs are not all the same. Some are much more energetic than others. I think that's likely what we're seeing. We're seeing. Other questions, comments? Well, in that case, let's thank Jim again. Thank you all. And I believe the cookies are being <laughs> Oh, okay, so not so much.